everyone. Welcome to Splitting Hairs. Hi. Ooh, we have a guest. We have a guest. We don't have guests that often, but we have a guest. So, Anna Morton, violinist extraordinaire, which will excite Annabelle. But what excites me is that Anna has a makeup and lifestyle YouTube channel, which is incredibly successful. So, hi, welcome, Anna. Hi, hi. Thanks for having me. I am, no worries. Now, you are in New Zealand now, but I know you because you're in Australia. So, why did you leave us? Oh, the COVID life, man, <laughs> just <laughs> made it so hard. Um, yeah, so my husband and I were in Australia for like about six and a half years. And when COVID like hit in sort of March last year, we were like, this will be fine. We have some savings. We'll just, you know, batten down the hatches and get through this, thinking it'd be a few months. And then kind of like Melbourne second wave yep. was like, kind of the nail in the coffin and it was about sort of July, August, we were like, maybe we should go back mm. just because it, we weren't like, it was quite hard, obviously being freelancing and that to get a lot of support as Kiwis as well. We weren't eligible for job seeker or anything. So um, yeah, it's just easier oh. to come home. Yeah, mm. definitely. But it turns yeah. out to be the right decision, right? You've got a job, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It was actually funny because we didn't come back to Christchurch being like, oh, there's jobs opening, so that'll be good. It was like we just decided to come back here because it's where our family is and it's where we grew up. Um, it was kind of like a just we'll go there for a year and then figure out what to do next sort of. Um, but then as soon as we got back, there were like job, like a bunch of tutti violin um, contracts opening with CSO. So... I would just have one of those about two weeks after getting out of quarantine. Amazing. Um, yeah, so that was fun. But it was successful. And then I've just passed my trial for that. Woo! Yeah, nice. so it's very exciting. Now, for those of you who don't know out there, this is a, our channel's all about classical music. And one of our topics were was um, it's, you know, it's hard to get a job. The reality basically. of auditions. The yeah. reality of auditions. And, you know, you're usually up against, sometimes can be hundreds of people. Um, and so, look, Anna, that is just spectacular. I'm really, really proud of you to sound like an old granny. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I, I'd like, well, both, look, Annabelle, she <laughs> says she's taking a back seat, but she actually I'm compiled not. the most amazing I list of questions for Anna. So, Annabelle, why don't you ask Anna a question? Don't just <laughs> give this thing to me. Um, well, I met you when we were both at Melbourne Uni, um, so you obviously came to Melbourne to study music and at the time you were doing your PhD which I thought was really interesting. Um, can you just tell us a quick brief sort of why you wanted to do your PhD, what was your topic and yeah. yeah. So I mean we didn't move to Melbourne for me to do my PhD. We originally, it was kind of my teacher here and um, I was living in Wellington at the time and she was like you know I think you just need to go away for a bit like, <laughs> get out of the country and that's that's very common because I feel like it's this really um pretty toxic kind of mindset in New Zealand where like if you haven't gone overseas and done the overseas thing we have it here like, hello yeah, it's exactly it like that for know, us except <laughs> we didn't go very far we're like yeah. where's the closest place that's technically <laughs> overseas and Melbourne is like a large Wellington so we're like that will be perfect mm. um and I'd actually never been to Melbourne Alex had been a few times for music things and I'd never gone but I was like YOLO let's move to <laughs> Melbourne it sounds great and um yeah, so we moved there. Originally, I was just like, I transferred with my little part-time retail job and was doing that full-time initially when we moved there just to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had met um, Dr. Kurt Thompson at the National Concerto Competition here. He was one of the adjudicators and he was chatting to me about how he lives in Melbourne and, you know, head of strings at Melbourne Uni and that I should consider a PhD program and blah, 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 blah. And then I had a lot of money thrown at me. Mm -hmm. money. Recruited. <laughs> Recruited mm. by Melbourne Uni's money. Awesome. They're like, it's very generous scholarship. So <laughs> I was like, getting paid to practice. That sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah. So Amazing. that is literally the only reason I did it. I'm happy to admit that. No, honestly, <laughs> I, it, I was like, I want three, four more years of just being able to practice, improve my craft. Yeah. I'd done like one professional audition by that point and I, I remember going along being like this will be great and then I hear everyone warming up and I was like I am not ready what? so it was kind of like I just felt like I was like I want more time to just improve my like baseline standard of just sort of playing I feel like because once you're in the industry it can be 
I feel like it's hard to find the time then to like keep improving. Like I just wanted that really like. Definitely. Well, we tried doing an experiment. We did. Go on. And I was thinking the same is, thing, Annabelle. This is so, I mean, this, this is the reality of it. Like March last year, I said to Sarah, what if we did this experiment of can a professional orchestral musician learn new music, you know, because your week to week is you've got that symphony, you've got that concert, you know, can you do it? And Sarah did it and it was Isai Sonata 5 and she started recording it all, you know, during our lockdown. There was all the time and then it just fizzled out. Yeah, I just couldn't. And I just couldn't be just bothered because I didn't and, have a deadline. That was actually and the, the real reason. Was, look, I still, I still think you can, but it just because of the way things unfolded, it was like, no. Oh, I just so couldn't. Hard. Yeah, so yeah. hard to have the motivation to be yeah. like, yeah, why am I practicing this mm. particular thing? I mean, but you had deadlines, right? Your PhD was extremely yes. interesting. Tell us yes. the topic of that. Yeah. So yeah, as I was getting to. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. We'll, it, we'll interrupt. Just I'm leave giving it to you us. Like a full backstory. On that. <laughs> so basically, um, yes, a few years of just being able to practice and improve my craft seemed like an amazing opportunity, and it essentially was like having a, a job because it's getting a living allowance and stuff. So it made it easier for me and Alex because Alex was at NM, which you know um, was about half the amount of what I was getting at Melbourne Uni in terms of what we could live off. So it mm. was very useful. Um, and I had always had a very big like fascination with 20th century violin concerti and originally my topic was going to be like a bunch of like 1930s violin concertos um, and that was going to be my kind of 1930s um, yeah there's amazing ones Stravinsky Britain obviously Barber like doing all of the kind of really beautiful Stravinsky's forgotten because everybody goes to Shoster and things yeah. like oh, that. Oh, and Shoster as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so mm. many amazing ones. It was a really like high point, I think, in 20th century concerto writing. Um, but I, in the end, I found it like just logistically difficult. I wanted to record them obviously like with orchestras and things, and um, rather than just a piano accompaniment mm. at, for my recital DVD like submission, and it just was too hard in that way, just with the resources that we had, and you know. So in the end. Um, I had recorded the Britain with the uni orchestra in 2016. Um, and so that kind of then just shifted. I was the, there. It was yeah. stunning. <laughs> I was there. It was absolutely stunning. Thank you. I loved playing that piece and I would, yeah, I'd love to do it again. It was just stunning. Absolutely. What were the concertos you picked? Um, originally, yeah, Britain, obviously Stravinsky, Barber, Shoster II, Prokofiev II. Mm. Mm. And um, Zhmanovsky too, mm. yeah, because I did Zhmanovsky <clears throat> one for my um, masters in mm. New Zealand, which I loved. Um, but Zhmanovsky two is very different. Mm. He had three very like distinct sort of writing periods, and number one is more like that impressionistic kind of. Mm. I call it almost like fauvism for music. That's the <clears throat> kind of vibe, quite sensual. Um, but then the his third period, where the second concerto was written, is very different. Mm. Um, but yeah, that was the original, the original six. Fantastic. Um, and that would have been really cool. But in the end, I decided to kind of just, um, I, I, yeah, focused my attention more on in, interpretive methodologies. And yeah. <laughs> what in terms of, what do you mean? In terms of historical terms performance of like, practice or? Yeah, like um, yeah. And how one develops an interpretation as a performer, like um, how one can almost cultivate a sort of relationship between yourself as a living performer and the dead composer, like through mm. specific research techniques and um, score studies and, and how to interpret things. And it, it's just, it was a very like, it went really deep. And that, yeah, that could be a rabbit hole because we did an episode about what we called the Anne Sophie. Uh, mother, phenomenon. phenomenon, which was this sort of, you know, detachment as the, you're playing the composer's music, it's not your music, and you don't want to sort of, like, become the headline of that rather. How did you sort of say it, Sarah? Because that was your one that you... Oh, but, yeah, that was definitely my one. I've always, I've grown up not enjoying Anne-Sophie Mutter's interpretation of anything, whilst at the same time I can absolutely understand why she's such a badass, she's so great, you know, yeah. like, what a what a force of nature, how... how petulant of me to, to say anything negative about her but at the same time from a performance practice point of view which is what our generation focuses on a lot 
her interpretation is based on how she feels about the music and not based on history. So, yes. so that's always a dilemma for me when I'm teaching as well. So, yeah, I guess Annabelle's yeah. asking you, did you come up with any of those roadblocks in terms of yeah, vibrato or, yeah. Totally. And yeah. I think, um, and Sophie Mutter is very much like at what I'd call like the extreme end of sort of personal ownership of yeah. the sort of interpretation of the score. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's her way. Um, but it's not, it doesn't suit everyone. Like not everyone loves that. But then yeah. like, mm. I feel like big crowds, <laughs> the general populace finds it quite exciting and loves it. Yeah. Um, and I, for me, for me, it came down to just finding that perfect medium between honoring yeah what was on the page but also f knowing that there's you can always add more to it and i think mm. adding your own personal interpretation to things and and is is a really important part because we're not just like translators as performers we are sort of creators in our own right and i think you've just got to find that way that feels as if it honors what the composer wanted mm. with your own sense yeah. I've always sort of viewed it as, um, I viewed it as a, you know, the composer can write the music all they want, but if you don't have someone playing it, that's the other half of it. It doesn't exist. Need. Yeah. It's so it's abstract. Like, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's music on paper, but it doesn't become yeah. sound until there's someone playing it. So you've got to find that, you know, yes. that relationship between the two. And there used to be a time where like the composers, oh, there still is, sorry, like when the composers are right there with the musicians and they're talking to each other saying you should do yeah. this or that's not possible. And, yeah. um, you know, I think we lose that when, you know, chike has been dead for how many years and we're still playing his music. So we've only got other people's play performances mm -hmm. of it and what we can see on the page. And I feel like often as performers, I mean, the whole performance body, and now that we have recordings and things to access, um, that's a whole nother level of kind of resource that we can tap into mm. to develop our own interpretation. But the, we do run a risk at times, I think, of sometimes just going off Copy. what other people do. Yeah, yeah, um, we spoke about that too. Yeah, it's just, a, it's just yeah. about making sure you've like done your research in all areas. I mean, I absolutely listen to different recordings. Janine Jensen is queen yeah. of mm. Britain. You know, like I feel like her interpretation was so what I loved. Also. Um, Mark Lebotsky's that was the one that Britton himself said this is the like version I've been waiting for wow. um, and I was pleasantly surprised because I'd already been working on Britton for quite a bit before I came across his recording and and really like spent time with it and a lot of the things he decided to do were like things that I'd kind of come to as well so I was like this Pat is on good the back. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. So, dog my dogmatic views of Beethoven Boeing's were shattered recently because my little brother who's pretty intense about everything sent me a video of clive brown the author clive brown he's sort of like a beethoven period expert um he always he, does the um it's always says like edited by clive brown yes exactly <laughs> and so he did a talk um a hour-long talk about beethoven bowings and i watched it and i just i loved it i thought it was fantastic it's all about free time and music like non-metronomic time and, and all that so i was like yeah i agree i agree i agree and then it got to the point where beethoven expected apparently, the performer to do whatever Boeings they wanted. And anyone out there who knows me knows that I am obsessed with composer Boeings. But I realise how ridiculous that is after this talk because each composer was different. Maybe one composer was obsessed about their own phrase markings and another composer, like Beethoven, just let the performer do whatever Boeings they wanted to, mm. especially because Beethoven was very like a lot of scales and arpeggios, seemingly boring runs and passages in the concerto, for example. So you can't just leave it like that, but there's nothing in there. So Beethoven mm -hmm. expected us to mm -hmm. put our own markings on it. Do you think anyway, it has something to do with the time period as well? Like in the classical period, there was less in, written and notated on the score because it yeah. was customary for the yeah. performance. Mm. And even earlier it. music as well. Yeah, whereas someone like Stravinsky was a very strong advocate for performers just translating what I write yeah, exactly yeah. who's very so much detail and that's very helpful as a performer to have a lot of detail but yeah. I think he went he went too far the other way mm. for me because I feel yeah. like he didn't didn't leave enough room to honor the expertise and 
art that yes. us as performers can bring as well. And yeah. It's always so obvious when you see a piece of music written by someone that doesn't know string instruments. It's like that chord's not possible. Mm, yeah. Like we can, if it's a, like an orchestra part, you can split it. Like um, Bernstein's one of them. He's like, is it pianist? You can tell. It's just like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, speaking yeah. of big crowds, like you mentioned before, <laughs> yeah, I've got a really complicated question. If you'll just bear with me, right? So. You've got this YouTube channel, Anna Elaine. It's a makeup channel, lifestyle channel. Now you've mm. got massive, massive, massive following. So the complicated part of this question is, what do you take from both your classical world? You know how classical music doesn't reach very many people. It just doesn't these days. It's not mm. part of the mainstream. I'd politely mm. push back on that, but for the but sake then of time, the, I won't. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. I no, mean, it's going to go. It's sorry. It's going to go into our next interview with our next person so I well will, yeah. I mean I guess in comparison to Ariana Grande it doesn't go as far no but I'm not talking about <laughs> the comparison between classical music and other music I'm talking about that you have access to thousands and thousands and thousands of people who love your channel so much which doesn't necessarily have that much to do with classical music even though you do post practicing and stuff like that sometimes but mm. it's really about I mean I I have obsessed over your videos before um try to cupid's bow today but I, i'm not quite <laughs> oh cupid's bow highlight yeah 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 and yeah. i think it's going to work better as i age and all of that but i'm, um, I'm obsessed put, with your i put foundation and mascara on so that's as much <laughs> as you get out of me <laughs> i'm sorry i like being girly but as far as like that new lipstick line i'm just like mm, mm. i love it my love sister it. would love your channel but i, I oh get... It's, no, 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 so, sorry. I, I'd like your channel, but it's more like, as far as makeup, it's just like, I know. yes. It's okay. I mean, I don't even post that much makeup <laughs> content these days. Anymore. I know. It's more lifestyle Definitely channel Definitely a now. big yeah. blend of yeah. lifestyle Yeah, it's great. <laughs> but so let, I don't let even me know try, and, <laughs> try and get you, the answer that sorry. I'm looking for. I know it's, a, it's, too, it's too complicated. This is my brain. So where do you get most of your satisfaction? Being a classical musician, slogging it out week after week, heaps of notes, being a violinist, you know, not getting paid per note, let's face it, and then yes, posting a lifestyle player. video yeah. and having 10,000 people press like. I mean, how do you feel about that <laughs> generally? Well, oh, I, I genuinely love performing and playing violin. So I don't know, for me, like, of course, I want to be paid for my work and I want to be paid well. And I'm, especially in regards to teaching, I'm very staunchly firm about what I know I'm worth as a teacher. Good. So I don't mm, good. compromise in that way. And I think I'm actually shaking things up a little bit here in New Zealand in that regard. Because nice. I came over and I was like, everyone's rates are too low. In Australia, we're getting this. So good on you. Come on. Fantastic. And I've seen a few teachers putting their rates up. So this my, is good. My Excellent. friend was, um, my friend's Fantastic. just... Just to deviate, my friend has has been a part of now this sort of trio of teachers where it's one teacher will have this student then send to here and then here and whatever, yeah. and they have to pay this. They have to pay the teacher the same rate. So yeah. he, his colleague now says, "No, your rate has to go up to what we are, and yeah. now you'll teach at that level because you're charging yeah. that much." Yeah, 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 yeah. So mm. do it. You can back yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like, there might be teachers that maybe aren't as experienced or you know um, aren't as qualified or haven't done it for very long or I don't know and it's fine to charge less like not everyone has to charge the same but I mean I have a PhD mm. and I've taught it is a Melbourne real qualification yeah it's yeah. a real qualification so I'm sort of like I'm not gonna charge the same amount because everyone has sort of agreed over the years to not rise with uh housing prices <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, look I've got another slightly awkward question for you I'm really sorry um <clears throat> so this awkwardness that you cause by coming in and making trouble like that because some What's people would trouble? look at it no but some people would resent it resent yeah. the powerful girl situation coming in going well it should be like this and some people might resent that that's what happens in australia did that mm. happen to you in australia to any extent like did the students try and pull you down or anything like that oh tall poppy syndrome yeah mm. um no i didn't find that at melbourne uni at least that's good um, i felt actually quite like a small fish in a big pond there like Aww. going to melbourne was very different to new zealand like i think i had a maybe a slightly inflated ego here before i left you know like you grow right. up in new zealand and you think oh well, 
we're at you know top of the youth range here like this is great but then you get to melbourne and you're like whoa yeah this is a yep. bigger pond and yep. so i don't know i don't i don't feel like yeah and it's, i uh, yeah. sorry it's interesting you, like you say that because um a friend of mine he plays cello and he 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 openly says you know when high school he felt like he was really 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 top and he was good and he's he's very good he's got so much better now and then he gets to melbourne uni and he realized he peers around you and you're like okay everyone is also good and then yeah. me when i was at melbourne uni with you i remember like my perspective when it comes to my peer level people is um rather than pulling down it's oh they can play like there's this sort of automatic automatic like okay well like they've got a leg to stand on kind of thing so i remember hearing you play um uh was it bark bark adagio the g minor or whatever it was and i was just played that (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. but just in in class and you know we had other um people in my year play Ezai and all that and for, you know for memory in front of class it's just like it rather than thinking I'm going to pull them down it's like well it lifts you kind of up because it's the way you view comparison either mm. you're going to pull yourself down or you can lift yourself up to go I mm. want to be more like that so comparison goes two ways pulling someone down mm. because you know you're not as mm. you're not as good as them or you bring yourself up to want to yeah. be that level as well mm. so I, I honestly yeah. felt a really nice culture at Melbourne mm. Uni and it was really refreshing and I think it was, um, yeah, I felt very welcomed and no one ever tried to, like there just wasn't a lot of cattiness or anything. It was really Well, nice. that's because we love foreigners in this country. You <laughs> see, it doesn't matter what accent you have, as long as you have an accent, we'll love Actually, you. Actually, no, I did get mocked a little bit for my <laughs> accent, especially in orchestra. If I remember one time, especially, I said something like, oh, this part here should be measured, like, like <laughs> not tremolo, I said measured. <laughs> And I remember the person who was sitting behind me was like, midgets? <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, measured, measured. Nah, nah, Maybe me. you've got enough self-confidence to not perceive that kind of comment as tall poppy syndrome, though. Oh, Maybe. look, it probably was, but I didn't care. Yeah. I didn't care. Yeah, I'm good the one girl. calling the shots. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of, you know, speaking of self-esteem and so on, um, let's talk a little bit about do you ever get nervous? Like, let's be real here. Do, are you Teflon coated or have oh, you struggled I, in the past? Oh, I, I'm i struggling now. <laughs> oh, really? So I'm not aware of your psychological yep. can, you yep. know, no, approach no, I, to music? Yeah, no, I, I definitely do, definitely do get nervous and definitely, um, yeah, like even right now for this, <gasps> you know. Yep. Don't I'm be nervous with us. I like it. <laughs> But oh, I think I have a good way of just. We love on a smile. you. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. so you're a performer. You're a performer. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. So the best thing you can do is just like walk out with a giant smile on your face. It's not yep. just for the audience to be like, oh, she looks confident in that. Mm. It does actually help to flip the switch from oh, I'm mm. so scared to I'm excited. Yeah. You know, like yeah. this is, I'm feeling a lot of internal physiological mm. symptoms right now, but it's kind of like. Yeah, I could be just really excited for this. That's probably yes. what it is, but it's like I'm. Sometimes I can interpret it as, um, it can be interpreted as fear. It's also quite a busy, stressful time here at the moment. We've got a lot of stuff on, so I'm feeling in general in life a wee bit like. Whew. Yeah, so that's are we a talking big about, one, isn't it? Are we yeah. talking about like life and personal anxiety or performance anxiety? Honestly, I life? say that I suffer with life performance anxiety. That's mm. the like for me. It's. It's not as acute anymore. It's more like a general dread <laughs> yeah. about things. Just when things are feeling there's a lot on and, like, yeah. for example, we're going to have to move in two months' time, so I'm always uh. starting to, like, think about it. You know, it's just, like, a lot of stuff. And yeah. when you're carrying all that, yeah, mm. I don't know. So is the channel, Anna Elaine, is the channel a kind of therapy at all? Um, I'd say it's both therapy and a cause. It's it's yep. very it's really difficult being online and and sometimes I forget that people watch it like it's <laughs> no I know that's silly but sometimes I'll just be like blah 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 talking about things and then just imagining that only people in like the US are watching it because like my most supportive followers and like active followers you'd say the ones that comment like mm. you know interact often they're like ninety percent of the time from North America or UK and things like that mm. um, and now like 
when I hear people like you, you know, like in my what I'd call normal life, like my music, like really like, close to you, like, like, oh, I can and, actually and talk they say to something them. like, oh yeah, I saw you talk about that on your vlog the other day. And I'm just like, that's so weird. I forget that people have access to that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that can, yeah, I feel like it, that can be hard sometimes to just know where like the boundary is. And sometimes mm. you just feel a wee bit like, you're just opening up your heart, you know, for the world to see a little okay, bit. Okay, you and said it was a cause. What do you mean by that, that it's a cause? Well, um, I kind of have to second guess, like, everything I put up and everything that I share because I think, like, is this, is someone going to, you know, not uh, like the way mm. I said that or, you know, and so you're, you're kind of on high alert all the time. So instead of just being like, blah, 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 you know, living your life with your mm. friends, like, they'll forgive you if you say something a bit stupid or... Mm insensitive or you know but like well, well even so, something as simple as being like if I said something like um oh you know I'm, I'm not gonna eat this cake today because I'm trying to be good like someone would be like ah, you're perpetuating diet culture rah. And yeah it's like, and yeah. I, I actually am quite staunchly anti-diet culture but it would but it's kind of like that would be something someone might maybe pull out of context or something and then you know, and then it and then you get cancelled and then you're like yeah yeah, well, yeah, social, yeah social media has become this absolute double-edged sword mm. and it's this permanent if you put something out there it's out there forever if you delete it there's no deleting anything someone oh, will find it screenshot it record it and so I you know. just have to be careful i double check the spelling of this every time i post something and i'm just like <laughs> I, I i'll look at a word I'm, that it's not not comparison but it's like i'll look at a word i'm like please tell me i've spelled that correctly because and i'll google i'm just like no it is correct but it's dumb <laughs> yeah. because i don't want the world like it's just oh my gosh you have to be so careful and yeah. you know the way you like the way we speak and stuff it's just it's out there like it, and it's really it's raw and then on the other side of that is social media like any sort of like um um, um, um influences and stuff it's it's a highlight reel of someone's life any social yeah, media absolutely. it's a highlight reel and it can be a great highlight reel but you know you're pretty open about anxiety and things like that and but that's I certainly really... don't show the extent of it. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah, of I course. Know, yeah. And that's that's your right to privacy, but also showing that everyone goes through anxiety and there's somebody out there that's a peer to mm. that. Um, so it's it's finding that balance as well. So, yeah. you know, and then you never know, like, did you start your YouTube channel to try and, all, like, get 100,000 subs or is it just this and then, it, oh, my goodness, it's grown. Yeah, last... can, you talk about, can you talk about the beginning of that channel? <laughs> you could give us some tips. <laughs> um, well, I don't think I have good tips because I feel like it, I've never really tried to actively necessarily oh no that's not true like once things got underway you know I tried to grow it I guess but I, I don't really know how I just sort of what year did you start it Anna it's quite a while ago like, now yeah it was like 2013 so it was a while back. it was while I was doing my master's and I just did like a few it was all beauty stuff back then and mm. some style things with those hilarious <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> did you did because you is it was a music uh, music uh, makeup makeup channel and were you yeah. in front of the makeup channel boom at this like with everybody oh. or come late to the game and, and no still... I think I was a little late to the game and in, in, in the style that I am like I'm quite um, pretty like natural makeup like I don't tend to do you know the insta glam makeup that's really intense like I'm not a makeup artist so mm. I feel like I kind of entered into the game when people that were doing my sort of it sounds really dumb, but like, you know, girl next door kind of mm. sit down, very chill, just like, mm. oh, I just like this product. And it's kind of quite like what we call old school YouTube. Mm. Um, and I sort of entered in maybe after that had been around for, for a little bit. I definitely think if I'd done it two years earlier, things probably would have been even bigger, mm. um, but that's fine. So entered in, but then it was like 2014, 2015. That's when we really started to get that really big, like Kylie Jenner kind of, and, mm. and sort of like the Insta glam makeup, trend like the very heavy stuff and I definitely tried to like jump in on that a bit and do that but it just doesn't wasn't really me it didn't really sit with me like mm. I don't know once you find your style I mean people well, that's people why that now I'm just like... unapologetically boring in my makeup I'm just like <laughs> oh I just don't care I'm like I like neutrals I love a neutral eyeshadow palette mm. I don't need it to have a million bright colors it's not my jam but yeah. I mean it's your because some channels are this new line by this brand has come out must try it must show you guys all about it. and then yep. is your sort of like this is what i like and this is what i've yep. found so 100 percent. yep so i very much 
I mean, the reality is that my channel right now is definitely what I would say at its peak because I've like, I've grown it over the years, but I'm no longer making what you call attraction content, which is where you're doing Click something page. like this new palettes come out and it's in the title and it's, you know, it's, it's mm. hot. Mm. And so you get people searching for it and mm. you kind of grow new subscribers in that way. Now it's like, I just do what I call like cultivating kind of content. So like the, the subscriber group that I have, I love, they're awesome. They're very supportive and beautiful people and they love my more like me content. So yeah. it's just like, these are things that I've been loving and, and these yeah. are favorites I've talked about before, but I want to talk, them, talk like about them new again. Sus new subscribers will find it for what you're talking about. Long-term subscribers will watch no matter what it is because they're watching for you. Exactly, yeah. that, and, but it's also that like transition. Yeah, mm. but it's also the title, like the the sort of the way you package those videos. Just they don't trend on YouTube, you know, like favorites videos talking about things I've loved this month, or <laughs> or just like you know, yeah, yeah, like cozy at home vlogs and things. They just don't trend well. well they're so. the most beautiful ones. So I remember this one you did. It was like, oh, it was just you pouring a coffee really slowly <laughs> and then putting it on a bench. And I'm like, oh, I need this in my life right now. Well, and that's the content I love. So I still watch very what I call sort of old school lifestyle content, mm. like the Anna edit. I love watching because her vlogs and that are just very chill. She's just like, she sets out the camera and it's very chill and she'll still do some nice overlay things. And um, I have my friend Rachel Ost in, in Melbourne. She does very beautiful, like aesthetic, you know, yeah, coffee pouring kind of mm. videos in that term. I, it's really calming and I it love is. that. And, yeah. and my audience that, my core group of subscribers that watch every video um they are the ones that like love that content and that's what makes me the most happy i've just gotten to the point where i'm like i'm only making content that makes me happy and well and if it makes you happy it helps you it'll help other people too yeah, so that's exactly i, and I watched just, this one called yeah. bailey sarian murder and makeup and she's yeah. so funny but i feel really really stressed at the end of every one because there's such horrendous stories and it's like yeah. No, go back to Anna. <laughs> I want to see that, that coffee pouring again. Yeah. Wait, do you, I mean, to put yourself on, like, the world's platform, or do you ever have moments where you go, I'm turning off the screens, I'm logging out, I'm, mm. and just because I think, in, like, I would want to find that balance of I'm turning things off and I'm going to go and read a book or I know you're always outside and stuff because I, I, I follow that. Um, mm. But do you ever, like, even pencil in to, to yep. do nothing and, yeah. Yeah, I quite often, if I'm feeling very overwhelmed, which probably this month, this month and next month are quite big months with work as well, like orchestra work, there's just a lot of gigs and concerts and rep to learn and all that. So mm. um, I think I'll need a bit more space in my day and not to be consumed by scrolling and mm. replying to people. And mm. yeah, so I'll definitely do a few log off half days or full days, you yeah. know. Yeah, I went through a period during, I think it was during lockdown or maybe it was the year before, one where I'd like every Sunday I just wouldn't go on at all. Like it was like full Sunday, no tech kind of mm. thing. Well, that's um, very old fashioned because Sundays used to be like yeah. a sacred day for everybody. Yeah. And, and now people cram stuff. I'm in the process of trying to wrestle back my Sundays as well because yeah. otherwise I, I'm not stopping, not yeah. stopping. It's yeah. not healthy at all. Yeah. No. Mm. Yeah. No, I really do value um, time off and rest. And I really try and encourage not just my viewers through that, but also musician colleagues to like take time off. It's, it's okay to not practice every day. Like have a Sunday off if you feel like you need it. Mm. Yeah. Annabelle, pay attention. I... If I, you enjoy it and you don't find it physically demanding, that's different. My, but, my practice is more like... I'll, I'll make notes of what I need to work on per day. And then if I, like my no practice day might just be, I'm going to open up that quartet, please, and just play through it for fun. Yeah, or Bach and, or something. You yeah, something that's just I'm not working on it for a lesson or anything. It's just um, that's the, some, I, sometimes I will go, I'm not playing today, but there's always a reason behind it. It's not a, it's not a for me thing. It's a I, something's come up or whatever. Mm. But more often than not, I do play every day. Mm. but I, I enjoy it you know. yeah if you enjoy it that's totally different and I mean I I enjoy practicing and enjoy playing it's just that sometimes 
just a, like as I say escaping the city and going for a walk is just what I'm craving and sometimes I'll come back and my practice will be better the next week because I've just had some time in nature yeah mm. actually and that total reset of the physical body is really important for just playing because if you're just full of mental anxiety it's just automatically translates to a physical problem and and yeah you can't get out of that cycle it's really really difficult mm, I, I go floating did you know i go um float sen- me too. Sen- sensory deprivation tank that's been like, the best thing i like the nighttime ones i always i haven't try. tried a night I, you keep Please! telling me to try nighttime because ones. Yeah, then yeah. you go and you have the best sleep of your life and then you wake up i had the best sleep of my life once and then the next day every muscle was relaxed and i did the best yeah, practice yeah that day. exactly just, what what do you do anna walking outside you've said yeah. but is there a, like exercise or um, yoga well, I, or anything I, like I that boulder <laughs> boulder so, boulder yeah so that? Like it's like balls. rock climbing, oh. but without ropes. Yeah. So I Did you say lawn bowls, Annabelle? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, okay, no. right. Yeah, so it's, it's like rock climbing without ropes, um, and you. but it doesn't go very high. Well, it actually goes pretty high for me because I'm absolutely terrified of heights, but it doesn't go high enough that you'd, like, die falling off. And there's giant squishy mats underneath, so... Yeah, indoor, so indoor stuff. Indoors, yeah. It sounds to me like you are constantly trying to conquer your fears. Yeah, well, this is part of it. I am definitely getting more brave, but what I notice if I'm not going very often and I come back and it's like like my height anxiety and Mm. and my my ability to trust my muscles and that Mm. on the wall goes back down a wee bit like the yeah. other day I got stuck on like a really simple problem because I was just like didn't want to let go of something and it was just really not that hard but it was like because I hadn't been for a bit I'd been about unwell and busy and didn't go for like a week and a half or something and th- yeah. that enough is enough for me to be like to revert a little bit mm. so yeah Alex says I need to practice jumping off the wall like falling off purposely just I hate the it. feeling of falling yeah. I know it's only a couple of meters but it's like enough to it's scary and I, he's like but if you do it a lot then you'll yeah, start yeah. to feel oh it won't matter if i go for something and i fall anyway because falling yeah, is actually not that bad so yeah and i get full on like like if i'm doing something scary i'll get like full-on shakes like on the wall mm. and that then makes it harder yeah and, yeah god so. it's a constant struggle isn't it it's just it certainly makes like performing feel easier and in some regards yeah yeah so everything you do it sounds like it everything feeds into everything else yeah in the and you're consciously doing it to try yeah. and it also like giving me really good muscles you yeah, can't see under this but <laughs> go on crank it out really oh. guns come in <laughs> Like I never had muscles, so for me, it's, they exist now. Yeah, that's I, I was, pretty exciting. I was going yeah. to the gym for a little bit with my sister. My sister, who's a gym junkie, her boyfriend's a gym junkie, like I don't have to pay for PT ever. And <laughs> they were like, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then maybe a couple of weeks and I was like, oh, I can feel yeah. things. You can't tell mm-hmm. things. Yeah. But, oh the my best God. are the yeah. back muscles. So with yeah. climbing, you get really good pull muscles. Mm. So I'm getting like wings down here and And actually speaking of violin but also just any sort of instrumental playing you want to focus on your shoulders your back muscles your abs Mm. you know it's not just biceps so if you're training here you're going to train triceps as well and Mm -hmm. you'll be physically stronger in your playing and you'll you know no reduced chance of injury basically so yeah yeah Mm. i I actually need to start doing some stuff though focused on that more you don't train like push-ups would be really good to sort of train the other set of muscles because mm. climbs all kind of back and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. every time you train one I'll tell you, have you to what train the other. my mm. left hand articulation is better since bouldering because you do a lot of like finger like crimps they're like really tight you know and you've got to hold on with just your fingers and yep. initially like I would always suggest if you're getting into it do it when you've got a wee break in your rep like at least a week to kind of, yeah because yeah. it can be a bit like you know tough on the muscles and hands and and just stop when things start to feel a bit sore because otherwise yeah. you might get tendon yeah. injuries but yeah. I found that like going consistently and like using my fingers more and that like I'm getting stronger and I just feel like like it's just like yeah mm, feels yeah. good to yeah. play good like yoga just, yoga was doing that for me for a while because yeah. all of those wonderful poses that you've got to hold your whole body up with your with fingertips, yeah, fingertips mm. pushing against the earth and all of these yeah. ideas and then you're like oh I'm so strong and then you get yeah. back to playing and it's easy yeah, yeah. well yeah. we sort of spoke about 
focusing more on your body when you're playing rather than, oh, the note and I can't mm. play properly. It's like, what if you think about this side and this side or whatever? But the answer to all of it is we should all be as performers um, – doing more like exercise and strength training because doing this for many hours yeah. in the day is not actually healthy. Yeah. So you've got to look after yourself and then, you know, to strengthen these muscles also, these muscles. So mm. just as a complete tangent, you know, if you want to be in a life performance, you need to look after both your mental and your physical health. Yeah, and the breathing um, as well. The breathing yeah. you're forced to do when you're exercising often yeah. doesn't come when you're playing. You go static in the breath. And, and you're not breathing and that also adds to anxiety too, and float it? therapy is really great because you just spend your time just like counting in your breaths and out and yeah. just yeah, your breathing will slow and it's just like a nice little yeah. everyone I should try it I tried floating once I found it a bit cold like it wasn't I think I'm a bit a bit yeah sensitive to cold it was like not I needed it one notch up mm. it was probably just the center my center has really probably. hot it's it's yeah. not hot but it's hot enough for me water. and I'm 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 like you I don't like being cold at all I my, can't stand it. my place is that they they um they they uh heat the water to your blood temperature so you're neither hot nor cold so you go in and it's just like neutral yeah, yeah. but I think that's what Anna's saying it's neutral like it's not warm right <laughs> I like I basically just want a bath and that's you what I spa. do relax yeah. too I love having a bath or going to a spa it's saline yeah. water so you could just slightly exfoliate the whole yeah. mm. <laughs> but like if your body temperature is like 37 degrees mm. I've, I've had that before I've gone to like hot pool places you know there'll be the warmer pools in the, and the ones that are like 36 37 they're too cold for me I need yep. to be like 38 39 but then anything over that is too hot and I'm like five minutes in and I've got to sit out so yeah 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 38 degrees is the sweet spot yeah right <laughs> a sensitive soul you are in more <laughs> more ways than one I, I I think we can wrap this up now we've got everything out of you that we wanted thank you <laughs> most welcome and Thanks i'm just so me. inspired by everything that you've done the the amount of notes that you've played in your life it's just extraordinary hard ones and uh let that be a lesson to everyone out there just do it because mm -hmm. anna just does it why not just do it annabelle anything more to say thank you yeah thanks, thanks a lot anna take thanks. care okay we'll do thank you so much for having me on okay bye bye